Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and welcome to Start Strong. We're here because your new hire, well, they said yes, and we want to make sure that that yes stays a yes throughout the hiring and onboarding process. Before we do that, though, we do have a few housekeeping items that need to be taken care of. Just as a heads up, you will be recorded. This workshop will be recorded. There is a chat box that is available for both questions as well as if you're having troubles with the audio. Just so you know, all lines will be muted to avoid background noise. There will also be time for a Q&A at the end, and you'll receive a copy of the slides within the next 24 hours. And please, please, please feel free to tweet using hashtag hashtag as HR chat. Now, without further ado, let's introduce our wonderful speakers, Marie Berkey and Christine Marino. Hi, everybody. As mentioned, I'm Corey Berkey. I'm the Director of HR here at JAD HR. Uh, it's really exciting times for us, and we're very much looking forward to presenting this information to you today. Um, I myself have been with JAD HR for just two weeks shy of two years. Um, we've seen a lot of amazing things happen, uh, n not the least of which is uh, a great relationship with our friends at Clipboarding. Um, and so today I am very honored to welcome Christine Marino to join us uh, for this presentation today. And Christine, uh, I'll invite you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Absolutely, and thank you very much, Corey. Uh, hello, everyone. I want to personally thank Jazz HR and everyone joining us on today's webinar. As Corey said, my name is Christine Marino, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today sharing information about the critical topic of employee engagement. I've been in the HCM space for over 20 years in every area ranging from talent acquisition to talent management. And I'm currently the Chief Revenue Officer for Clipboarding, uh, where our sole focus is delivering an amazing experience throughout the candidate and new hire journey. I've been invited to speak on this topic in many diverse venues, and I am extremely thrilled to be here uh, with Jez HR. So thank you very much, Corey. All right, before we get started, I'd like to kick things off with a very quick poll. All right, so the question is, Employee engagement begins on the new hire's first day of work, during pre-orientation, during the interview process, or the first time you hear from a candidate. We'll take about 15 seconds, and then we'll tally up some results. That felt like 15 seconds. <laughs> so let's go ahead and see the results. Interesting, 100% of us answered during the interview process. And that's absolutely a, a critical point of where employee engagement begins, but the reality is it begins the very first time you hear from a candidate. So let's talk about why we're talking about engagement. We're talking about engagement because now more than ever, employees need to feel connected, that you care about them, that they matter, and what they do makes a difference. When you look at 33% of employees in the U.S. are engaged at work, this, this might be a, a good statistic for some people. I look at this and I personally think it's terrible because that means 67% of your workforce is unengaged. That's more than two-thirds of the workforce spending on average eight to ten hours a day at work feel they're not cared about or they don't matter and that what they do does not impact a higher purpose. Can you even imagine going to work every day feeling like you don't matter and that no one really cares? The overall impact it equates to $605 billion in lost productivity every year. So let's break that down into something that may feel more real. Assume you have a 100 employee organization. 67 out of 100 people in your company are negatively impacted, impacting your productivity and retention 
because they're not engaged. You know, Corey, have you ever been in a situation throughout your career where you, you know, didn't really feel like you were cared about, made much of a difference, or just blatantly unengaged? You know, I think we've all had sort of those off days that everybody refers to, uh, and I feel like, uh, you know, I've been pretty fortunate in my career path as I've always been able to feel engaged in the opportunities I've had, or at least most of the time anyway. Um, but when you're having one of those gloomy days where you feel like a zombie or you wish you just hadn't gotten out of bed to come to work, uh, we all find ourselves, I guess, feeling out of sorts. Um, but we've all been witness to that type of situation no matter what. We all see a person that sits a few desks away from us or walks past our office each day, uh, and they, they just seem like a zombie going through the motions. And as business leaders, I think we have to be working to curb this as much as possible. We've got to find ways to keep this from happening in our places of business um, because really once it starts to happen somewhere, I think it spreads like wildfire in, in way too many cases. Um, and one of the first ways to handle this is to get in front of it, I feel, and that's what we always try to do at Chaz HR. Um, but I think we all need to take a proactive approach to setting the tone uh, and doing this very early on with everybody who joins our company. And Corey, I completely agree. Being proactive is key, and this is something that we need to get in front of. Um, you know, I, I too have been very fortunate in my career and always feeling, you know, engaged that people really cared and that I did make an impact on the organization. However, I did have one experience that I'd love to share with the group. Um, I was being courted by an organization, and let me tell you, they did an amazing job. They didn't miss a beat. They didn't miss a phone call. They were never late meetings. They were constantly following up. And what was awesome is they really learned about me and what was important to me, not only on a business level, but a personal level as well. So the, the offer gets extended and I finally accept it. And this was, a, this was a really big change for me because my entire career had been spent in massive publicly traded organizations and this company was a privately held smaller company. Post offer, so they constantly were engaging again, they were sharing fun facts about my new team um, you know, dispersing information about the company that I didn't have access to just on the website. And my first week was going to be spent in New York City, one-on-one -on -one with my new boss, which is awesome because I'm from New York, so I love to spend time there. Uh, during that time, I would be receiving my laptop, and every day we had an itinerary of information and different processes that we were going to be reviewing. So I'm on the plane, and I land in LaGuardia Airport. At this point is where I learned my boss was not there. He had something else he had to address and would not be around the entire week. So I had no laptop, I had nothing to review, and a return ticket five days later. And don't get me wrong, Corey, I completely enjoyed the awesome food and entertainment that you can only find in New York State, uh, but I can tell you I was extremely uneasy. I wasn't thrilled about the decision that I made to join the company, and I felt like maybe I didn't make the right decision. And those feelings, they, they stuck with me for a very long time. So. Like Corey says, let's get ahead of this. Let's see what we can do to avoid a, a loss in Manhattan fiasco, so to speak. All right, engagement starts with recruiting. So when we go back to the poll that we took in, in trying to understand where everyone thinks engagement begins, it starts with that first initial contact and to continue consistently throughout the employee's journey with the organization. So it's sort of like dating, right? You meet someone you like and you dazzle them, and then they agree to go out with you. You prepare the perfect venue. You dress to the nines, you bring some flowers or chocolates, perhaps a bottle of wine, and you show up, you're early, you're eager and excited, and you guys have a great time. Then days go by, weeks go by, and, and you don't call. No texts, no Instagrams, no Facebook, nothing. But you had a great time, and you want to get together again as you think that this could be the one. So you reach out, they answer, and with great enthusiasm, you say, hey, I had such a great time when we went out, and I would love to get together again. How about dinner tonight? Anywhere you choose. And the answer, no. With confusion, you, you say, what? I thought we had a great time. You said it was the best date you ever had. And the response you get, it was. But I never heard from you again, and I moved on. I went with someone who not only did we have a great first date, Every day since has been amazing. I assume that everyone sees where I'm going with this, but let, let's break down the process a little bit further. So in the analogy of recruiting is like dating. You are constantly looking for the perfect match. 
Hey, that, that's exactly right, and it's a great analogy. Uh, everybody on the line, you know, take a second. Think about the candidates that your business approaches. What channels do you use to connect with them? Is it a cold call? Are you reaching out via email? What's your messaging like, and how do you set the tone for your communication? You have to start engaging candidates with your employer brand very early on in the process because candidates want to get to know your business just as much as you want to get to know them. And remember, at some point, and I am very open about sharing this with the candidates that apply to Jazz HR, I feel like the tides change and it goes from me shopping for the right candidate um, to those candidates shopping for me being the right employer of choice for them moving forward. And it all starts very early on in this process. When you're working through your branding, you really need to find a way to be consistent. You should use your true business brand as much as possible. We all know all of our businesses have spent tons of money on making sure that our materials are curated the right way, making sure that we've got a cohesive brand, and that really should extend into this stage of recruitment in building out your candidate pool uh, to make sure you're recruiting to meet your business needs. Take some time to consider ways to translate how you keep your team engaged in health into messaging for your candidates that shows serious interest in your business. Also keep in mind, you're probably not the only person involved in hiring people for a specific role, and everyone related to that role should understand what you're doing to create experiences for candidates that are memorable. And those folks should be supporting you just like you're supporting them in creating a, piece, a cohesive message. Your worst enemy can always be that person who's in an interview for your company and goes rogue with the candidate, and that can potentially damage that opportunity to work with somebody who's a great fit for that position and make it irreparable. We also take a look at a few other things, and I know that this is starting to sound like a marketing webinar, but if you really think about it, that's what's happening to the recruiting world. There's so much for anyone who touches recruiting to learn from your marketing folks. Marketers are great at nurturing leads for your business. They nurture leads for your sales team. They keep them engaged in your product and your brand and help them understand what you're doing. And as somebody who touches this process and should be focused on engagement, you, you should see that those skills oftentimes translate into this process. Think about how and when candidates hear from you. How do you stay in front of them and make sure that you remain their employer of choice. Consider this and try to develop a cadence that goes from the very first initial contact with somebody who's interested in working for you uh, all the way through the night before they start working at your company. Don't feel like you have to own that entire process either. Hiring managers and even team members can be reaching out during this time to keep somebody engaged in your company. That time from offer letter signature to starting work is always critical and it's always a little bit of a hold your breath moment depending on your industry and the type of company or type of role that you're working on here. Lastly and most importantly, there are very few cases, like I said, where there's just that one person involved in the process. So get plans in place and communicate that plan and that scheme with everyone who touches recruiting in the organization. From the person who answers your front door when people arrive for their first in-person meeting at your company, all the way to the person who closes them on the phone after the offer. All of these things can't be in a binder at the bottom of your closet. They should be right in front of everybody who's in the organization and plays a role in your recruiting efforts. Thanks, Corey. You know, the critical takeaway here is do not let engagement stop once the offer is extended or accepted. Because if you do, you run the risk of turning that amazing new hire into a no hire. And Corey, you're spot on when you talk about, you know, when you're recruiting, they are so interested in understanding and learning more about the employer brand just as much as they are trying to learn about you. So constantly promoting and putting your best foot forward from the very beginning is critical and will only be a positive input to your recruiting in the future. All right. Here we go. Did you know that 4% of new hires don't show up on their first day. Literally don't even walk through the door. And that 20% of new hires quit within their first 45 days. So think about all of the effort placed into sourcing top talent. The time and the energy spent carefully aligning the best talent with the right position. 
all of the resources internally that Corey just talked about that are involved in the hiring process. And finally, the decision to hire is made and the candidate accepts the job. So here's what I find to be interesting. At this point, the candidate who just a short time ago was presenting their very best to secure the offer is now scrutinizing everything said and done or not said or done to determine whether or not they're going to stay or if they're going to leave the organization. This is why we cannot let engagement stop once the offer is extended and accepted. All right, so we've all heard that fancy word, onboarding. Let's go ahead before we move on and take, a, take one more quick poll. So everyone can see on your screen that employee engagement begins on the new hire's first day of work, during pre-orientation, during the interview process, or the first time you hear from a candidate. So let's take, we'll take 15 seconds here for everyone to go ahead and submit their responses. All right, let's go ahead and close things out and see what everyone says. Okay, so it looks like we're pretty solid on the first time you hear from a candidate. And it looks like we're during the interview process just a little bit. And, you know, having a discrepancy in some of these answers really supports that onboarding is very loosely defined in the marketplace. You know, some people think it's completing an I-9 and a W-4. Some think it's the offer. Um, you know, the blunt answer is it's really all of this. You know, reputable organizations like SHRM have defined onboarding, as you can read here. But simply put, onboarding is the function of acclimating an individual into a new environment and making them feel connected. Making them feel connected and comfortable and informed throughout their entire journey. When onboarding is done right, and new hires feel comfortable and connected, and that they have information to ultimately make them be successful, organizations benefit with an 18% increase in performance and productivity in the first 90 days. They benefit with a 50% increase in retention and brand loyalty. So, Corey, you covered that nicely. Um, but imagine your employees bragging about how great it is to work for your company. That certainly makes recruiting much easier. Okay, let's break down the fundamentals of onboarding. Think about what needs to happen during the onboarding process to deliver an engaging and great experience. I'm going to help you kind of get there as we frame this up, okay? A few examples of the who's and the what's. So an offer is extended and accepted, a background check initiated and completed, uh, new hires complete required forms, we got everything ranging from I-9s to company policies and procedures, um, hiring managers, are driving the welcome wagon. Payroll has to get the information about the new hire into their system. Uh, we have to get IT involved so they can order the new hire's PC, get them email, appropriate company access, offices, cubicles. I mean, the list goes on and on. But let's dive a little bit deeper. So recruiting or human resources typically manage the onboarding process until at least day one. However, as Corey mentioned, there are many others involved in the onboarding process. We've got the hiring manager, payroll IT, just to name a few. But these individuals are responsible for tasks assigned to them by HR. And the struggle that we have is that not everyone involved in the onboarding process has access to each other's system. So what ends up happening is the tasks fall through the cracks. And when this happens, well, in my scenario, a new hire may be found in Manhattan, <laughs> unengaged, with no laptop, no boss, kind of hell in the tail. Another struggle is until the new hire's first day, it's up to the high, it's up to HR, excuse me, to engage with the new hire and provide them with an awesome experience. Now everyone, this within itself is a challenge to do once, not to mention with every single new hire. So many organizations struggle with onboarding because there's there's really no map. There's the process isn't documented, which makes it difficult to be repeatable and reliable. So instead of collaboration between recruiting and HR, we tend to see separation. So we need to have a documented standard so there is scale while never losing that personal touch with the individual. Because without a standardized process, your new hire feels disconnected and confused. 
And this is where they start to be part of the 67% unengaged statistic, which we learned directly impacts their performance and productivity. All right, so let's move on to necessary requirements. Right? We all know that there are lots of those. So we have required forms including by no means stopping at the federal Form I-9 and state w 4 Audits continue to rise and fines are imposed for inaccurate or missing forms. And without electronic forms, electronic signatures, and secure online filing systems, HR struggles with being 100% confident that the organization isn't at risk. And the new hire, especially if they're completing these forms manually, feels confused and they're frustrated by such an antiquated process. And the last piece I want to touch on is kind of that warm, fuzzy, touchy feeling that tends to make people a little bit uncomfortable. We're talking about connected, comfortable, and informed. Does a new hire know where to go on day one? Do they have a day one itinerary telling them when to come and when they leave? Are they aligned with a mentor? Do they know the dress code? Nothing is worse than showing up in a suit if you're allowed to be in shorts. Should they pack a lunch? Are you taking them out for a team lunch? Were they able to complete onboarding tasks at home on their iPad while clicking through Netflix? We talk about necessary documents. Do they know what they need to bring so that the Section 2 of the I-9 can be completed on time? While many organizations have some of these items addressed, far too many of, of them don't. And missing any of these components, everyone, and expecting a prepared, comfortable, and engaged new hire is setting yourself up and your organization for failure. Okay. Now, regardless of whether or not you have an automated or homegrown onboarding solution, onboarding done right can easily be broken out into three categories. And those categories are forms, task administration, and what I love to say is, you know, show me the love, set me up for success. Everyone uses the word socialization and engagement, and I challenge us to really look at that and understand what that means. And then ask yourself, based on your definition of socialization and engagement, are you doing things that align with how you define socialization and engagement? So that's why I like to break that out and to show me the love, that me up for success. Okay. Forms, the necessary evil of onboarding. However, overlooking or minimizing your forms process for new hires is a big mistake. It's a big mistake because it sets the tone about your organization. 68% of new hires complete their onboarding process on a mobile device or iPad. When they have to download forms, complete them, and upload, or worse yet, bring them on their first day, fill out their name multiple times and address over and over, they really start to question their decision to join your company. And this is the slippery slope to unengaged. We move to tasks. So, Corey, I love how you frame things up and really, even in the recruiting process, the understanding that this isn't a one-person show. Onboarding is no different. It's not a one-person event. There are tons of tasks and critical components to the entire onboarding process. Organizations need to have all the tasks orchestrated, ideally in an electronic format. There needs to be a clear view in real time of all the tasks being completed. So when your new hire shows up on day one, they know what to expect, they know where their workspace is, and they feel ready and they feel connected. All right, so why is it important to prepare your new hires? When we reduce stress and anxiety, new hires show up eager, engaged, and ready to contribute. I mean, think about it. The less stress and anxiety we feel, the happier we are and the easier it is for us to maneuver throughout our day. And when we arm them with information, new hires feel informed, they feel knowledgeable, and that makes them feel prepared, which directly impacts performance and productivity. And when we continually communicate, new hires feel comfortable. They feel like you really care. And all of these, <laughs> excuse me, are contributing factors to new hire engagement. All right, finally, when we infuse hires into the organization, this is what I like to call the inside-out approach versus the outside-in. New hires feel connected. They feel like the organization has made an investment in them, and the new hire turns into a positive investment for the organization. All 
Uh, and I apologize, Corey. I'm having some challenges with the meeting. So if you can advance slides. Everyone, I, I want to thank you all for joining today. And I hope that you're walking away with a clear understanding that when engagement starts with recruiting and continues throughout the onboarding journey and beyond, organizations have committed and engaged employees which directly impacts their performance and productivity. So the question I have for everyone is, do you address engagement at every step of the new hire journey? Thank, thank you again. Corey, I'll, I'll turn things back to you. Uh, I believe we've got time for some Q&A. Yes. Hey, Christine, thank you again so much for all of the information. Uh, all of this is very helpful. Um, folks, just in advance of us doing some housekeeping, uh, there is a Q&A box on everybody's uh, browser window. Feel free to enter any questions that you might have for us. I have Lindsay here from our customer success team who's going to field some of those questions over to us. Um, and we do have some time here to answer some questions. So feel free to start loading up the Q&A box. Um, again, Christine, thank you so much for joining us and, and taking us through this information. Uh, I'm glad to have you around for questions and answers here as they start to come in. Um, we have uh, some that are already starting in. Uh, Lindsay, if you can, um, give us the first one you have on the list, please. Sure. Sure, no problem, Corey. So we have the first question here is, how long does onboarding usually last? So that's a great question, and Corey, if you don't mind, I'll jump in on this one. Um, I, I applaud whoever asked that question because onboarding, it's interesting. So the shift in the marketplace, onboarding used to be something that happened on day one. Um, it's backed up and being recognized as it truly is an entire life cycle event from recruiting day one and beyond. But the marketplace is truly shifting to, it continues to that nine and 12 month period. So 30, 60, 90 day reviews training, ongoing touch points, a mentor program. So the fast answer is onboarding absolutely continues through their first year. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Lindsay? Okay. So we have another question here. What are some options to conduct internal audits on how employee engagement is in your company? Uh, so that's another really great question. Uh, I will kick that one off with um, saying, you know, don't hesitate as the person who uh, is responsible for this or is one of the, the key stakeholders in this uh, to talk to people. I mean, get out there and have conversations. One of the things that we always have to try and correct for is just making sure that we're getting, you know, that right level of, of candid and transparent feedback. Uh, at Jazz HR, we do um, a biannual survey as sort of like the backbone of my measurement of engagement in-house. Um, and then we have some other things that we do throughout the course of the year. Um, but, you know, nothing is more telling in my eyes anyway, and Christine, I'd love to get your take on it, but nothing is more telling uh, in my eyes than whenever I have the opportunity to sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one with members of the team and, and get their take and understand how they feel about being a part of our Jazz HR family. But, Christine, if you have anything else to offer up on that, I'd love to hear it. Absolutely, Corey. Uh, you know, getting it right from the source's mouth is always the best. Uh, constantly doing check-ins. Um, what we do at Clickboarding is we measure the success of employee engagement based on how quickly they go through the onboarding process. So the actual, uh, from the second that they're engaged, the offer is extended to how quickly they participate in the invite that they receive to come into the system and start to do some of their onboarding and meet their mentor and the engagement that they have with their mentor before day one, how quickly they go through and complete their forms and look at different information that we share with them uh, day one is a very strong indicator of the engagement post-hire. So I, I completely agree with you, Corey, getting it directly from the source's mouth and we actually uh, manage how fast they go through the onboarding process is an indicator of retention rates once they're on board day one. Awesome, thank you. Lindsay has a few more here. Okay, so what type of information would you share with a new hire to minimize their anxiety before day one? Uh, another awesome question. You know, I think that this is really twofold, at least in, in my opinion, it's, it's really two different things. You're sharing information with them prior to day one, Obviously, like Christine mentioned, things that you bring in to work on the first day, um, how to get into your particular office, where to park. Uh, even at Jazz HR, we send you a packet of um, 
lunch places that are nearby that your team's going to take you to one of those places on your first day um, and also to help you get a little bit of a greater understanding of what's around our offices. Uh, but even things like um, just that team communication. As soon as somebody sends a, a signed offer letter back to us, uh, I meet with the hiring manager for that role as soon as I can, and we establish sort of like, okay, well, I'm going to reach out to the person via email around this date. The hiring manager is going to call them a couple of days later, and then I might give them one last call a day or two before they're ready to start to make sure they have everything. And I can't speak enough to that process of keeping them um, sort of in the loop of what's going on in the company, getting them up to speed and getting them that critical information, um, even down to, you know, one of my sort of war stories around this was uh, we had made a, a hire here at Jazz HR, and um, it was uh, just – it felt like the normal hiring experience, honestly. I mean, nothing was outside the norm. We had a great engagement with this person leading through the entire process, um, sign their offer letter. We pinged them once, I think, between the day that they signed and the day that they were supposed to start. And uh, unfortunately, I wasn't going to be in the office. It's, it's going to sound a little bit like Christine's story, kind of. But um, I wasn't able to be in the office on their first day, uh, and it was because I was going to be traveling. Here, the, uh, the day before their first day, it was a Sunday night, um, I landed, I got off of my plane, and I had a voicemail from this person. They called me at 7.30 Sunday night saying, you know, that their employer had, their previous employer had offered them um, what they said was a, a, a new deal that, that they wanted to, to kind of pursue. And it was just such a bummer. And, you know, looking back, I always wonder if I had done one more reach out or something like that, would that have played out differently? But um, I can't, I, I can't overemphasize uh, the importance of staying in the loop with people, staying in touch with them um, during that sort of in limbo period. But um, Christine, feel free to add on to that, of course. Absolutely. Corey, I agree with everything that you said. Um, what I will add on top of that is really acknowledging the emotional component and the stress that an individual feels when they start a new job. You know, whether or not they were looking for the new job, they were recruited, a merger acquisition, um, these are very real anxieties. And I always encourage people to reach out on a personal level. I mean, absolutely, you want to align with business goals and objectives, but if you find out what's truly important to them and what matters to them, you completely disarm them so you get to have those real truthful conversations that much earlier. But once you align their personal goals and uh, with business goals, you'll have a higher success in really achieving the results that you're trying to get. Um, one thing that we do at Clipboarding is we, we do uh, three fun facts, right? But we take it a step further. It's not just tell us three fun facts about yourself. When we get those three fun facts, three individuals within the organization will reach out to that person ahead of time, referencing one of those facts. So it's truly not a, a function of, you know, let's go through and make it look like we're trying to learn about you. We genuinely do stuff with the information, and we keep it current and dynamic throughout the year. That's awesome, Christine. I like that. And I'll tell you, one of the things that we do that's uh, a little bit similar to that is that whenever folks are actually throwing their head in the ring to be a part of Jazz HR, uh, one of the questions on our, like our, our application process to be considered a candidate for a role is uh, what makes you unique? And you get, it's almost like a tweet. You get 150 characters to tell us what makes you unique compared to the rest of the talent pool, and then that's stuff that we hang on to, and we can do games and stuff with it later um, as, as people come on board. But it's, uh, that's really exciting. That's a great idea, too. So um, I think we have or just a few more. more. I'm sorry. One more thing I would suggest because we started doing this about six months ago and it's, it's really gone a long way, especially since we've hired nine additional headcount in the sales department. Um, when my VP of sales brings another individual into the organization, I personally reach out to them uh, the day before they start and then they have a voicemail waiting from me. So when they come in there, they've got a voicemail obviously on day one um, and I send them an email as well. That's awesome. Yep. More great tips to the process. Uh, and those are both great ideas, too. So, um, all right. Uh, Lindsay, do you want to throw one more our way here? Uh, and then we'll see where we end up, guys. Sure. 
Sure, no problem, Corey. So it looks like we got two questions about um, the remote workforce, work from home jobs. So I'm just going to try to knock that out in one question. Um, are there any type of special considerations or onboarding tips for companies that um, just post strictly remote jobs, only work from home jobs? Are there any type of special considerations or onboarding onboarding tips that you guys would have for these people? Sure. Another great question. You know, we see a lot that uh, work from home is coming up more and more, and uh, it's something that candidates aren't afraid to ask for, and it's also something that a lot of businesses are shifting to um, because there are a lot of upsides to that. Uh, so, you know, I think where I start to consider that uh, is whenever I'm, I'm looking at somebody who's going to join our company and they're going to be working remotely, um, one, I, I, can't, uh, I, I can't not start with um, the face-to-face -face interaction that can come from making sure that they're comfortable with things like uh, Google Hangouts, um, Skype, or whatever your, your video conferencing software is so that they can still sort of get that face-to-face -face connection with others on your team. Um, and I'll also say uh, one of the things that I found helpful in my former lives with work from home where somebody was exclusively in a remote role with no on-prem work at all. Um, I dedicated about an hour or more, depending on that person's level of comfort with technology, uh, to one-on-one -on -one time with IT or an IT admin um, so that they can really understand the technology tools that we have. Because if you're doing work from home, there's some sort of intersection with technology that will help to um, make that engagement stronger and help those folks that are remote feel like they're more a part of the team. Christine, anything to add to that one? Uh, at Corey, again, I, I agree with everything that you said there. Um, I try to make sure that the entire first week, their, their very first week, is spent here at headquarters. Uh, so they have the opportunity to meet the team, to know the people that they're going to be working with, with that technology in this scenario, I might even say as a barrier, um, you know, obviously not being able to have that personal interaction. Uh, I always, always suggest make sure if you can let them know a cadence that they will be brought into headquarters, they will know that ahead of time. On the same token, don't overcommit something because if I'm expected to fly in four times a year and you only bring me in twice, uh, that's kind of counterproductive. So be very realistic if there's um, a company event or you know, kickoff meeting, something that you have on a consistent basis. Let them know the expectation is that we want you to be here for that, another opportunity for them to feel connected. And everyone, this is going to sound silly, but I learned this one the hard way. When you look at you know, Google Hangouts, Skype, whatever that technology tool is you use to be able to interface, um, let them know that we know you're working at home in sweatpants. And that there's a good chance when you woke up this morning and took your two-second commute to go into your office, you didn't stop at the shower, and that's okay. Because I learned in managing a decentralized workforce that a lot of people will avoid turning on their, goat, their, their camera, their webcam, excuse me, because they are you know, sitting at home comfortable and everyone else in the office might be a little more polished. So it sounds silly, but it's very, very prevalent in, in today's day and age. That is very, very true. It's, uh, it, it's like a, a lot of people, you know, you see them kind of like sitting down in, in video calls and their face is really close to the camera because they don't want you to get the full picture. And it's, it's, uh, it's comical to see those types of things play out, but it, uh, it definitely does happen. And I think that people are getting um, more and more understanding. So great advice. Uh, we are going to take time to do two more questions as a wrap-up. If you've submitted a question that we have not addressed, uh, we have your name, we have your question, uh, and somebody on either the clipboarding team or the Jazz HR team will get back in touch with you. Give us about 24 hours to take care of any questions that we don't address. Um, but having said that, we're going to take uh, two more that we have teed up, and all the others we'll address here in the very near future. So, Lynn, did you want to send the next one our way? Sure, no problem, Corey. So this one says, what are your recommend recommendations rather, to get supervisors to take onboarding seriously? Awesome question. Um, and I will say, uh, you know, I, out of my group of peers, I feel like I'm very privileged because I'm in an HR seat at an HR company. Um, so I think I probably get the least resistance out of most of the peers I know in the space. Um, but really, whenever it comes down to it, you know, if you have somebody on your leadership team that's, you know, energized by metrics and return on investment, um, there are ways to, to conceptualize what you benefit 
uh, how the organization benefits rather um, from a tight and crisp onboarding process. Um, much the same token, you know, you've got hiring managers that are always concerned about their own turnover. And like Christine spoke to, you know, turnover can run rampant through your organization, especially if engagement lasts. Um, so definitely leverage the fact that uh, a formalized uh, plan around all of this tied together uh, can really help manage those types of, of pivotal metrics. And, and Christine, anything to add to that, I'd certainly welcome. Absolutely. Thank you, Corey. Um, this truly is a great question because we find it a, a lot, many times, that there's a little bit of a, a gap in time, if you would, between the baby boomers and the millennials. Uh, and what we typically see is a baby boomer has different expectations. And if you think about it, when they started into the workforce, uh, they knew they had to work and that's how they got a paycheck to support their family. So they didn't need any of the feel good. They didn't need the rah-rah. They didn't need you know, to have constant information fed to them. They knew they had to go out there and kind of figure it out themselves. So I've had some challenges in really working with individuals that have kind of that mindset and understanding that it's, it's not a bad thing for individuals coming into the workforce today to want to know information, to feel like they have a seat at the table and that what they do say does indeed make a difference. So it's important to point out the fact that that might be how it was then, but the evolution of the workforce today is dramatically different. The tools that we have to be successful are dramatically different. Uh, you know, when we talk about automating onboarding into organizations that, um, you know, tend to have the baby boomers managing the organization, if you would, they, they're not interested in an electronic process. Like paper forms, that, that's okay. And the reality is when you look at the efficiencies and you focus, like Corey said, on the ROI, you can really start to bridge the emotional component and the hard data facts to help them understand the value in really putting focus behind onboarding. Awesome. All very true. Great point. We are going to take time to answer one final question, but as I mentioned, if you put questions into the QA box, uh, and we have not addressed it. Uh, we have your information and we have your question. We will certainly get responses back to you. Um, just give us about 24 hours and somebody from Jazz HR or Clickboard and we'll get back in touch with you. Lindsay, do you want to give us that last question, please? Sure. So this one says, how does clickboarding work with Jazz HR to help with employee engagement? Is this a software that is integrated with Jazz HR? Great. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Um, so I'll take the first part of that question where Jazz HR comes into play, and then certainly Christine uh, take the, the second part there with the uh, clipboarding um, piece added into it. Um, certainly with Jazz HR, you know, you have so much control over your workflows and your processes. Um, and I can tell you from using the app myself literally every single day, no surprise, I use it um, day in and day out. Uh, it really does help create a candidate experience, and that's what all of this sort of revolves around, managing the way that you're messaging to people, managing the cadence around those communications, um, and making sure that you're able to provide sort of like the same voice throughout, uh, especially if you're a one point of contact um, organization, one point of contact uh, for candidates who are considering joining your company. Um, it really helps you sort of tee those things up um, and because of our great relationship with the clipboarding, um, it does provide uh, a little bit of an easier channel than what you typically find, uh, especially if you didn't have solutions like Jazz HR clipboard, clipboarding. And, and Christine can certainly tell you about um, sort of like the exchange that takes place there and where clipboarding picks things up. Absolutely. So thank you, Corey. Um, you know, we were extremely excited in, in developing this partnership with Jazz HR for all of the reasons Corey outlined. Uh, the softwares are extremely consistent in the true focus around the new hire experience and the entire journey starting at the recruiting end. So once the decision to hire is made from recruiting, the technologies speak to each other. So the integration will automatically take the information that's in Jazz HR and populate into clickboarding so it's seamlessly kicking off and initiating the onboarding process. The biggest piece or the biggest value I think that we bring to the marketplace is we're, with the consistencies in, in the user experience and understanding each other's core focus around making sure that the candidate turning into the new hire doesn't get lost and continues to feel as important in the onboarding process as they were in the recruiting process, we're able to deliver that through the integration and through the consistencies of our technology. 
Awesome. That's great. Hey, everybody, thank you again so much. I especially want to thank Christine uh, for being a part of this. It's been a pleasure working with everybody clipboarding through this. Uh, we really hope that everybody who attended the call today was able to take away some information that you can apply to your own business. Um, as mentioned, we're going to get these slides out to you just as quickly as we can. Uh, we've committed to 24 hours. We'll hold to that, get those to you, and also follow up on any hanging questions. Um, if you have any questions specific for Christine or myself, when the deck comes out, you'll have all of our contact information. Feel free to drop us a line, and, and we're happy to, to get into a conversation with you on anything that we might be able to help you with. And we hope you all have a great day. Thank you again for dialing in. Thank you, Corey. Thanks, everyone.